the stragglers in, so we'll go ahead and get started. I, before, before I really do <coughs> go through this whole presentation, I timed this last night, and it goes a little over an hour and a half, so I wanted to ask, is there anybody in particular that's really in a time crunch and has to be out of here like right at 11.30? And be honest, if you do, I can try and speed through this a little bit. Okay, okay. Um, and so we'll kind of pace this. Like I was mentioning before, there are a bunch of handouts right there on the other side of the hallway there, off to your right. So during the break, we'll take a break about halfway through. And then you're welcome to pick those up. Just kind of has some summary points. Because I'm going to throw a lot of new information at you that you've probably never heard before or maybe just heard a little bit. Um, but my name is Chris Sovey. I am a physical therapist here at Mindful Movement. I'm also a registered nurse. And I think between those two, I've had a really broad diversity looking at the medical spectrum and looking how this can apply to whole body healing. It's, a, it's definitely a big interest of mine to look into how we can heal the whole person starting from the ground up. And I think that's one of the things that we do here at Mindful Movement. And of course, it's more from a muscular and movement perspective, but I think this, this lesson ties in well. I wanted to start also by saying that this is not a medical presentation. So even though several of you may be suffering from some type of disorder, if that's what brought you here today, it's going to be more of a lifestyle-based presentation. That being said, a lot of these things can apply to the things that you may be suffering with. Um, I have a couple notes here that I just want to go over real quick. Does anybody have a nut allergy? In here, We're going to do a little mindful eating exercise later, so, okay. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> um, and then if we could, I'd like to save most questions for the end or during a break. If you have a specific medically based question and you want to just kind of discuss it with me, uh, we, could, we could chat about that as well after the presentation. If you have a burning, dying question, then go ahead and raise your hand. But otherwise, I'd like to try and leave most of the questions for the end if we could. Uh, I, I'd also just like to say I'm really grateful for this job and every day that I come in here. Uh, I just couldn't have a better staff, people to work with every day. And so I just want to thank you guys for helping to put this together. I know I definitely could have done it without you. Really, for me, this, this ties back probably about seven or eight years ago when I started looking into uh, my own health journey because I was dealing with a lot of health problems at that time. During that time, I was going through things like major depression, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, a lot of problems with my gut. And I was really searching for answers. And I at first turned to Western medicine to try and find some of those. And the more I got into it, the more I wasn't finding the answers that I was looking for. So I started to become a lot more curious. And, I, and my mind is just always looking for more information. And so that's within my nature to do that. I think I started out just like anybody else on the standard American diet. I've gone all across the other spectrum to becoming a raw vegan. And then I backed off that as well. So I've seen a lot of different populations and how food interacts with them and what it means to them. Uh, but one thing that I want to mention is probably why you're here today is trying to learn more about yourself. And I think that's what we do at Mindful Movement. And I really have to sell this to you almost like a sales pitch because I think that in order for you to internalize some of these concepts, we have to understand some of the benefits of paying attention to what's going on in your gut. So, one of the, we can look at these individually and kind of break them down. Um, no matter what you do, it doesn't matter if you're an Olympic athlete, it doesn't matter if you have a desk job, it doesn't matter. This kind of thing can apply to you because the food that you eat, that you take into your body, is going to make up the building blocks for everything that you do. So if, if you care about this and you take the time to listen to your own body, you can have improved productivity. And as we'll see, the gut makes up over 80% of our immune system. So with that, you can have a stronger immune system. You can avoid or reduce the cost of uh, medical procedures sometimes. And you can decrease pain and suffering. Because as we'll see, this is a very systemic, <coughs> systemic approach to this. And you can take control of your destiny and health. You really have a lot more power in yourself than you realize to make changes. And if you're an athlete, you can improve your athletic performance. I want to focus on three major take-home points. These are 
I'm, I put these on the, on the summary sheet, but I just want to go over these. These are the big ones here. The gut is one of the largest components of the immune system. And it makes up more than 80% of it, actually. There are other systems that are involved in the immune system as well. But this is the first one to interface with our external environment. So everything that comes into our body. Just kind of like the respiratory system in a way. The rise of several chronic diseases is at least partially and in a lot of times majorly due to gut pathology. Food was never really meant to be convenient and convenience comes with consequences. So we have to understand that, that very basic fundamental thing. And that's not to say that we can't use technology to uh, better improve our health, but we have to use it responsibly. So it really dates back to philosophers like Hippocrates who said that all disease begins in the gut. And he was also a physician as well. He said, let, let medicine be thy food and food be thy medicine. And I think that our system now, our medical system, is fantastic at, at specific things. And we have a great emergency care system. And, and when, we, when we look at chronic disease, though, we have a long ways to go there. And I think we've become reactive instead of proactive in a lot of our approaches. When I think of the gut, I say, I, I say a patient of mine had told me that, that uh, he would equate it to like a, a pot of boiling soup. And so if we have some kind of inflammation that's rising up within us, instead of putting out the fire, we would, we would throw ice cubes into the pot of boiling soup. And eventually, that would rise up again and the inflammation cycle will continue. So sometimes we want to look at what's the root cause of a lot of these gut problems. And we can get to that. But just like Sue and many others have told me before, we often have to fix ourselves. We're, a lot of times, we're not going to do it for you. We just give you the tools so you can get there. I, I have a relatively long commute, so I, I drive about 40 minutes. Not terrible, every day here. And so when, I, when I'm there, um, in my car, I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Zig Ziglar would call it Automobile University. <laughs> and so uh, there's a book that I'm listening to right now. It is called The Power of, of Vulnerability. And it's by a shame researcher. Her name is Brene Brown. And so she looks at shame, guilt, and addiction. And I think this really ties into what we're talking about today because it's become so pervasive within our culture to shame others. And, and we want everything to be bigger, better, faster, skinnier. And it leads to a lot of addiction. There's, there's so much tie-in with the addiction factor, whether your crutch is food, whether your crutch is alcohol. Um, and what happens is this competitive nature, we lose all empathy. And, and we often are quick to judge others, whether it be the weight or the way that they look. And as a result of that, we forget each individual has their own story and that they're struggling with a battle that you know nothing about. And so we have to understand that and, and try and infuse empathy back into our society. Before I go really in depth into this, we have to have some basic understandings of what the gut is, what makes it up, and then we can, we can dive deeper into this. I'm not gonna give you an advanced anatomy lecture here. This is just a very basic understanding I think the gut breaks down into two components. It would be called the macroanatomy, so the big parts of the gut, and then the microanatomy, the smaller structures within the gut that help us to assimilate nutrients, to bring those into our gut. And then that's what helps us to get everything into our body that we need to and use it appropriately. Backing up even further, um, when we are when we're looking at, at embryology here, so just very basic, I promise this won't get too in depth. But as we're dividing in, in, in our cells, in our development, we develop an inside layer. Um, this, is, this is you at some point. And the inside layer here is called your mesoderm. And as it continues to divide, it makes this hollow tube all the way from your mouth down to your anus. And so we have this hollow tube throughout our body. And that, that stays with us throughout our entire development. So really, in a sense, the gut is an open system to the external environment. Um, now this is a very simplified picture here of, of the gut, but these are the main ones that I'd, I'd like to talk to you about when we're talking
talking about digestion, it really starts in the mouth. So when, when we're chewing food, and as we so often do, we're just really rushing and we don't chew our food. So really we should be chewing each bite about 15 to 20 times to allow some of those enzymes, like there's one called amylase that helps to break down sugars and starches. And so we really should need to slow down when we're eating. That's, that's the first thing. We're so rushed and we have to make this a priority. And as the food travels down, travels down the esophagus and makes its way into the stomach, a lot of people have problems here at their esophageal sphincter and develop things like acid reflux disorder. And, and then we make our way into the small intestine and large intestine. So I, I really am just absolutely fascinated by the gut. I think there's, there's, so much, there's so much to it that relates to our personality and our whole being. One of the things that's, that's fantastic about it is um, we'll start up at the stomach here. Now this is the first place where the acids and everything start to break down your food and emulsify it and start to break those down. Um, and a lot of people have probably heard about that and we take things like tongues when we're getting heartburn. And, um, but the other fascinating thing that a lot of people aren't aware about about the gut is in the stomach, there's actually a very large uh, amount of serotonin receptors in there. So these are their feel-good chemicals and a lot of it actually resides in the gut. So Harvard researchers have looked at this connection between the gut in the brain, and they call it the gut-brain axis. So when one of them is suffering, the other is likely to suffer as well. And so a lot of times we'll see different disorders, such as autism, such as generalized anxiety disorder, such as major depressive disorder, that are all tied in in some way or another <coughs> with gut pathology. There's definitely a correlation between the two. It doesn't mean that one's always causing the other but there's a big correlation. So when you feel butterflies in your stomach, you have that sense. You feel that connection between your gut and your brain. And so it's just fascinating how much there is a connection between your nervous system and then also between your gut as well. So we make our way down. Again, this is very simplified and we're, we're missing some big parts here, but we make our way down into the small intestine. And when you hear the buzzwords like probiotics and gut flora and things, this is the area that we're focusing on. This is the small intestine. This is where we absorb the majority of our nutrients. And so we focus a lot on this from the gut health perspective. This is, this is a big important one for you. The large intestine is going to absorb water and any remaining food and then expel it all the way down through the anus. And so that's the macro anatomy. That's, that's the big stuff there. And when we, we get down to a smaller level, we're looking at the micro anatomy. So we've taken our little hovercraft and we've gone inside the body now and we're, we're in the small intestine. Okay. And, and what we have up here are these little finger-like projections called the villi. And these villi, it's, it's actually a genius design. These little finger-like projections, what they do is they increase the surface area so they make your gut a lot more efficient at absorbing nutrients. And, and what happens with a lot of things like celiac disease is these become significantly damaged and they're not able to do their job. They either grow, colon cancer, they will grow. They'll have significant cell growth. And that also can impair it too. So there has to be a fine balance. So as food makes its way into these little areas, when we come down, they're called crypts in these little valleys here. And in the crypts, a lot of the interface with your gut flora, so the bacteria that's inside your gut. And so it makes its way in there, and the bacteria and the different areas of these are going to absorb your food when it's working correctly. The, the big thing is they, they're arranged in a way, I'll show you on the next slide here, um, when we get damage to the gut wall, this is, so this is kind of zoomed out. Ignore all this stuff right here. We're not looking at any of that. But there's those little finger-like projections, okay? Your food's coming in here. And this is a big, it's like a, almost like a big rectangle. They call them epithelial cells. And so what these do is they're stacked right next to each other, all along your gut wall. And they form these areas in between them called tight junctions. So they're like, if you thought of a wall, it would be like, 
an old wall would be like the spackle in between the wall that, that prevents things from getting in there. And so if we have a lot of gut pathology, sometimes, sometimes these tight junctions are damaged and we create small areas where things can go through. And this is what we see in things like celiac disease and other things like that. Um, and a lot of things that we're doing in our environment, in our culture, are damaging this connection. And it's very dangerous because what it ends up doing is it creates a very unhealthy environment for your gut to do what it needs to do. So on the left, we have some of the, the healthy villi again. Okay? On the right, I know it's kind of blurry, but you can see how it's like all kind of grassy and worn down. This would be someone who has a section of um, someone who has celiac disease. And so there's a lot of causes for that. It's not just gluten and things. I think of, I use the analogy of a castle wall with the gut. And so again, here we have those, those little enterocytes, that big column cell that I showed you before. In between there would be the spackling. So those are the tight junctions that prevents food from making its way, or other things like bacteria, yeast, fungi, making its way in between those cells. And so if those tight junctions, that spackle is damaged, then things can make its way into your bloodstream. And we end up with increasing allergies and we end up with autoimmune, dis autoimmune disorders as well. So we're going to back up a little bit so you can understand this a little further. Um, a lot of the beginning of this presentation is more of a philosophy because I have to set the groundwork for you guys so you understand why the uh, functional things that you could do to improve this um, make sense. So really, our whole medical system is based on one guy, Louis Pasteur. That was really the father of, of Western medicine in a sense because he was, these two guys, they, they were kind of bitter rivals. They were both researchers in the early 1800s. And Bacomp believed that we should look at the individual or their terrain or that area that I was talking about inside the small intestine. So they, he, he was saying that the individual is important and we can do a lot to strengthen that immune system. Instead, what we've adopted is Louis Pasteur's version, and he's actually famous for a lot of things, vaccination, he's famous for pasteurization, of course, and hence the name, fermentation, and a lot of immunology. So we have, we have two people with very contrasting ideas, and Bacomp was kind of buried with his research. I, his, his ideas are now no longer really thought about much except more in the natural health circles. So we look at the, the individual and how can we strengthen that immune system? How can we strengthen that internal environment? So if you take two people that are exposed to the same type of microbe, whatever that might be, so if you're exposed to the flu bug and I'm exposed to the flu bug, one of us gets sick and the other one does not. Why, why is that? I, I think that it comes back to this terrain. How strong is our immune system? And what can we do to change that and influence it? So a gut, the gut is a great place to stay <coughs> because if it makes up 80% of your immune system, why not get the biggest bang for your nutritional buck there? So what we have now, and this is very pervasive within our society, there was a lot of controversy within the medical system, whether or not this was a true diagnosis. And you look through the literature now, and there are so many people that, that actually have this, and it's becoming more accepted. So we have, we have what's called leaky gut syndrome. It's kind of a funny name, um, but here's an example. Just for this picture, they use little pieces of gluten. And this is just an example. It could be anything. You could take a bacteria. You could take a virus. We're back in the small intestine, and we've got our finger-like projections here. Okay? Our gluten is making its way in. Now, this tight junction has been severed by whatever cause, if it, if it was the gluten or it was not. Uh, really, honestly, gluten is a problem for, any, for anyone. It's not, just, it's not just those that suffer from celiac disease. And the research is really coming out about this now because within gluten there is a chemical called gliadin. And what gliadin does is it comes into these areas, the area of the villi, and it lands on a little lock and key spot called a receptor. And when it comes in there, your body produces what's called zonulin. And zonulin is not talked about at all. But zonulin, it starts, the more gluten you eat, the more zonulin you keep producing. And they find in the research that, that people who have high levels of zonulin 
um, typically have celiac disease as well. But so it's a problem for everyone because this zonulin production ends up creating these holes in our tight junction. And then that opens the floodgates for anything else to get into our immune system. So instead of thinking the approach of, you know, we do allergy testing and we go, we go to doctor's office and we get all these different tests and sometimes those are very appropriate, but sometimes the underlying cause for seasonal allergies and things like that or these continuing development of food allergies is actually a problem like this. We have this problem because we can keep trying to figure out the mystery diagnosis of, okay, I have a peanut allergy at first. Well, now I have a peanut and corn allergy. Now I have a peanut, corn, and soy allergy. Why am I getting all these new allergies all the time? So sometimes, sometimes it's something like this. And a lot of times it actually is. And so, as you can see, if, if anything can make it through these floodgates here and they can make it their way through these tight junctions, then we, we can even have influences on autoimmune disorders as well, which is very common, actually very common. And this is, this is where it gets really interesting. And I guess I'm, I'm such a geek in terms of like uh, my, microbes and things like that, but I, if I wasn't a PT, I'd probably be a microbiologist. And they, what, they're, what they're researching now is how much of our body is actually made up of bacteria, and it's crazy. Within our body, we have about 10 trillion cells. When in bacteria, we're numbered 10, 10 to 1. So we have 100 trillion bacteria. So we're kind of walking around with this huge amount of bacteria within us. And so it matters about the balance of those bacteria. Some of the microbiologists are looking at the research of what this means to us. It, in, in your health, what it means in your digestion, in your personality. That there, have been, there have been a lot of researchers that have looked at how these bacteria actually talk to one another. And so if you get, you get a flu bug or something like that, at first there, these, these bacteria or these viruses are able to communicate with each other in a way that they know they can overpower your immune system. So they send signals to each other. So if, if I had 10 cells of this virus, and then later, they're like, oh, there's no way that we can take over this person's immune system. Then they have 100 cells. Then they can send signals to each other, and they can say, okay, we're going to attack. And I'm obviously simplifying this quite a bit. It's a lot more complicated than that, but I'm just trying to paint a picture here. I don't know if, have you guys ever seen TED.com? Have you been on that, that website? Really fascinating. If you want to learn a lot about a lot of different things, go on to TED.com. They have lectures about just about anything, uh, people in the top of their fields. And there was a lady on there named Bonnie Bassler, and she talked. She said, how bacteria talk. And I was so captivated by this. I think it was only about 14 or 15 minutes long. But we have these, these communities, these communities of microorganisms within our bodies that inhabit us. And we share these with each other. So you share these bacteria with your, your spouse, with your dog, you know, and, and so all these work, there's about 10,000 different species that we're currently exposed to on a regular basis. And we get so out of balance with these because of the things that we're putting in our body, in our body um, within our environment. And so if you think about this, this actually goes all the way from your mouth down to your anus. And it makes, if you're a female, it, works, it, wakes, it makes its way into your vagina as well. So you're coated with all this bacteria. So if you have if you have an imbalance in this, then you'll have an imbalance everywhere in your body and you're prone to things like yeast infections. Uh, so what happens is, we have, if we have an imbalance, then the other bacteria that come in can take over our immune system much easier. And so, what's our current solution? I mean, in America, it's kind of go big or go home, right? You got a little heartburn, you're going you're gonna to down the tums and keep downing the tums. So, if we go back to the stomach picture that I showed you before, and within our stomach we have hydrochloric acid, which is extremely acidic, and it has a pH of 1 to 2, and some people up to 4 to 5. So let's say you get an onset of heartburn, and you take a couple Tums. And so what would that do to your pH if you took some Tums? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what do you think will happen if we continue to take this? What happens is we have, we are constantly on that basic side. So the bacteria that's normally in your gut 
in a, per, in a healthy gut is going to um, be overrun by some of these other organisms that like this basic pH. They, they crave that basic pH. They hate the acidic pH. They don't want to be there. They'll get eaten up real quick by your stomach and if it's working properly. So we want to have that, that fine balance and we want to have a more acidic gut. And I know that sounds controversial and I know that sounds completely different than what you've heard, especially when you look at things like acid reflux disorder and you say, well, we don't want, we don't want more acid. We want less acid. And so we take things like proton pump inhibitors to um, lessen that effect. And some people have completely an anatomical defect. So in that case, it's kind of hard and you do have to do something like that. But I've seen a lot of people who have completely reversed um, or significantly reduced an onset of uh, GERD or acid reflux disorder through a primarily a plant-based diet. And and it's across the board that way. If you look at any of the research, there's so much of it that shows that it can decrease inflammatory markers for just about everything, autoimmune disorders as well. And, and so it's really about, instead of just saying, we go back to Bacamp and Pasteur, it's not, it's not do we get it, it's do we express it. So if I'm a healthcare provider and I'm in the hospital, I'm exposed to things like antibiotic resistant uh, organisms such as MRSA on a regular basis. But that doesn't mean if I get a cut, I'm going to have this big gaping necrotic wound that's just going to you know, keep eating away at, at me. So that's, that is, if we have the right internal environment, we can prevent these things from expressing themselves. By the way, if you do have GERD, or you do have acid reflux disorder, something that you might consider is a lot of fresh pressed vegetable juices. Ginger's a really good one. Herbs are really powerful. They have, I mean, they're commonly not looked on um, as they should. So what does disease mean to you? I mean, is it, if we have a spectrum of well-being, is disease only the absence of illness? And, and I think you can be so so far on that, on that spectrum. And a rough translation of disease is lack of ease. And, and through this kind of approach, we actually, there's a developing field called epigenetics. So if you say to your healthcare provider, my family has heart disease, so I'm bound to get heart disease. My family has cancer, I'm bound to get cancer. Some, some cases that's true. There's some things that we just can't change. But in a lot of cases, we can. And this, this growing field of epigenetics looks at uh, the expression of these diseases. So it's like a light switch. If I, if I want to turn on a gene that's going to cause a problem, that's what they're, that's, that can be done through lifestyle. This can work for or against you, depending on what you're eating, your exercise, things like that. So I don't necessarily have to get heart disease just because my parents had heart disease. There's a huge lifestyle factor, and it's, it's massively underplayed. Again, there are obviously some exceptions to that. So Bruce Lipton, if you want to learn more about that, this guy is, is phenomenal in that field, and he'll tell you a lot about the field of epigenetics, and you can get a better understanding of that. I won't go too in-depth into it right now. Really what we're talking about is inflammation. So root, it's really the root cause of nearly all chronic disease in one way or another. So even if you don't have a clinical diagnosis of some type of chronic disease, we have this constant low-grade inflammation from an assault on the gut. And, and, that, and that's from a variety of factors, but mostly through diet. And it plays an enormous role in things such as inflammatory bowel disorder, uh, IBS, Crohn's, Crohn's, even though it's not formally recognized as an inflammatory disorder, we still have these, these low-grade inflammation going on in our body at all times. And so, in, in America, I mean, we have, we have in, in the medical world, we, we classify people in two different types of shape. The apple shape, so kind of more, um, more weight above the waist, and then we have the pear shape, which is more weight below the waist. And a lot of this really comes down to inflammation. And where this, I see a lot of people, after you get your hands on enough bodies, 
you can kind of, I mean, as a physical therapist, you can, you can feel, oh man, that came out wrong, did it? <laughs> Let's rephrase that one. <laughs> After you therapeutically touched enough people, <laughs> uh, you can almost feel this inflammation in people. And, and the question is, where is it? So if we have a lot of this inflammation and a lot of our weight distributed above our waistline, then more of it is surrounding our vital organs. If you have more junk in the trunk, that's actually not a bad thing. So in, in terms of comparing the two, you're much higher at risk for obesity-related um, disorders and, and things that go along with that if you have the apple shape. And you can take this, if you want to write this down, if you want to figure out if you're an apple shape or a pear shape, you take your waist, so you would come around the waist, and then you divide, you take a measurement there, and then you would divide a measurement at your hips. And then you take that, that ratio, so you'll get a decimal. If it's greater than 0.8 for women, or greater than 1.0 for men, then you're an apple shape. And that puts you in, in that category of slightly more risk there. So Can really, those yeah, absolutely. For, for women, it would be greater than 0.8. For men, it would be greater than 1.0. You divide the waist measurement Yep, so weight, waist over hip. Mm -hmm. Is your waist your belly button? Yes. Level? Yep. Thank you. Right at the level of the, the belly button there. Thank you. Really, we need to go back to empathy to begin. So to really get into this a little bit, we have to look at um, things like self-love meditations and, and really starting to understand ourselves a little better and appreciate ourselves a little better. So we had the gut-brain axis. We talked about that a little bit, how your mind is so closely connected. You can directly um, approach it from a gut perspective, but you can also heal the mind at the same time. The two work together. So again, it can work for or against you. Uh, Self-love meditations are a great way to do that. It, it sounds corny, but if, if, you, if you spend time in front of a mirror, or if you're just laying down and you close your eyes, and you just express gratitude for two things each day, um, and you breathe in and out free breath cycles of what your definition is of compassion, what your definition is of gratitude, forgiveness, and love, and you flood yourself with those, it'll help you along the healing process. I originally kind of planned this presentation almost as strictly like a how-to kind of thing, but I, I feel like how-tos really don't work. I, I think they only partially work. We're, we're missing a lot there. If, if how-tos worked, so many of us wouldn't be still searching for answers. And, and so we have to look within ourselves for answers. So where do we start? I, I originally had this picture on here of this like really tasty looking burger, and my fiance Danielle, she's like, that makes me really hungry. So I had to go back and find the nastiest looking burger I could find. So I typed in Mc gross McDonald's burger at Google and I came up with that. I hope that makes none of you hungry. <laughs> it does, we've got some work to do here. <laughs> we've become a real culture of convenience. And, and that's, that's really at the, and, and that convenience comes with consequences. And we don't have our priorities in the right places. So we can save up all kinds of money to buy the next big screen TV to keep up with the Joneses, or we can put some money into a juicer or a dehydrator or some of these things that can nourish our bodies and make us more productive, and then you can afford that big screen TV. I mean, that's a win-win there. It just takes a little more effort. But we have so many unanswered questions of how this environment affects us on the deepest levels from what we're putting in our body. I really hate to use the word dangers, but honestly, there are a lot of dangers within processed foods. I wanna, I got a quick little story here. Uh, my parents' house originally, about 36 years ago, when they were, um, when it was being built, this Pringles can was locked up within the drywall there. And, and so I, we found this later because they were doing a remodeling on their house. So this, these Pringles are, are 36 years old, it says 59 cents, I'll, I'll pass it around. Please don't touch the Pringles, I want to preserve this for future shock value. But if you look at them, 
they look exactly like Pringles from 36 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> and so we run into a lot of issues. And it's worse today. I mean, we have so much more in our food than we did back then. If you look at the ingredients label, it doesn't look that awful. It really doesn't, but there's just a few things in there. Like the hydrogenated vegetable oils. So, we have very commercialized food production. And diets don't work. They don't work. As soon as you get done with your diet, you're eventually going to go back to how you were before. Whether it's, it's just a matter of time. And that's, that's well accepted um, within, within the community of, of uh, literature. So, really, what I'm, what I'm trying to preach to you is not a diet, it's a lifestyle. And, and what, what it really comes down to is, in the last 200 years, we've had more changes to our food system than we have in the entire human history. And this really goes as far back as 1750 in England. How were you going to deal with the rising population crisis? And, and, and now, it's even considered more of a crisis. So we turn to different things like genetically modified foods. And this whole system has become so mechanized and, and so commercialized that everything is pro-inflammatory. And we go back to an inflammation. And this is really where it starts, within the way that our food is grown. And it's not the answer to, I argue that it's not the answer to the rising population. We have other means that we can feed the growing, I mean, there are things like high-performance agriculture. And these organic standards, using high-performance agriculture, has outperformed things like genetically modified foods, despite their claims that the whole reason they're doing it is so they can grow more crops. And so what, what do we do? Our, our government is, is subsidizing massive amounts of money towards the, the growth of corn, soy, and canola. It makes up greater than 94% of our land mass planted in the United States. And these two of these happen to be, the corn and soy happen to be two of the most common allergens. Um, and more so, as time goes on, we're seeing more and more corn and soy, corn and soy um, allergies. Have, any, have you guys ever seen uh, Food, Inc.? You ever watched that documentary? Really good one. I, I highly recommend watching that one. It, it gets into how it's such a big business now. And it's, it's not really about feeding the masses um, in a way that's going to be beneficial to anyone except those that are producing these and lining their pocketbooks with that. So uh, it's highly inflammatory. And, and these two, corn and soy, make up almost everything you see on the supermarket shelf. It's really just a cornucopia of illusion. It's a clever rearrangement of corn and soy is what it is. And it look, when you walk into a supermarket and you go down the aisles, it looks like you have so many choices. You're like, wow, I have this brand and this brand and this brand and this. But really, you're just eating corn and soy, and it's just been processed in a different way. And then we have things like this. Um, we have artificial sweeteners and flavors. And, and when you look on the back of a label and you see something that says natural flavors, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means nothing. There's no regulation on that at all. Natural flavors could be anything. The term natural just means that it started somewhere along that line as a plant. 300 chemical processes later, we end up at this. And, and so you can't even find out what those things are unless you have a doctor's signed note that says, I have a medical reason, I need to have you disclose this information to me, if you call up a company. I'm a total geek. I do this stuff. I call, I call companies and I ask them those kind of things. Because I'm curious. I'm a curious mind. I want to know these things. And so the people that design artificial sweeteners, they're, they're geniuses. I mean, they, these guys, they know how to get inside your head. And that's their job. And they constantly refine that so it becomes addictive. More addictive than many other drugs in a lot of cases. And so our natural biology, we can't, we can't resist that. It's, it's very difficult to resist this, and we become quickly addicted to these foods and all these different artificial sweeteners. Uh, the biggest company that produces it is called Jivadan, and there's a 60-minute segment, 
So it's 14 minutes of that 60 minute segment. Um, and it's called Tweaking Tastes and Creating Cravings. And it's a 60 minutes thing. If you, if you just go on YouTube and you look that up, it's really fun to watch because they, the, uh, the newscaster, he, he just bashes on them the whole time. And, and they're in denial about the fact that this is a huge part of the obesity epidemic that we're dealing with today. Was um, tweaking tastes. Tweaking tastes yeah. and creating cravings. Do you guys see this in the in the news recently? That they they found this uh, in Subway bread. They had this this yoga mat <laughs> chemical in there. I love to throw these little things in because I just think they're so um, so amazing. Azido kai azido got kai azido carbonamide. There we go. <laughs> and, and it's in more than 500 different foods. And so I love this stuff because what the, what the food companies do is they, or places like Subway, they're like, we now don't have this chemical in here. What do they put back instead? You take something out, you got to replace it with something. This, this, this chemical is actually a, like a foaming agent. So it makes the, the bread more kind of like fluffy and foamy and have that really nice kind of fluffy look to it. It's actually in a lot more foods than just Subway bread. Um, and I think that's the irony behind it because you look at, I, I was walking into Meyer the other day and I saw this thing, that they had this big craft single and they were like, now with no preservatives. And, and you look at it and they've replaced it with some like really gnarly chemical. But they, they make it look all, all just like, oh, it's so nice. And we use bright color palettes. So um, it's okay. It's okay. You really want to know what's the truth about the food that you're eating. I, I think it's the middle point between two extremes. Um, we, have to, we have to look at, at what some of the, the news sources are saying and what all these biotechnology companies are saying to us and then maybe what, you know, we don't necessarily have to eat 100% everything from our organic garden. I mean, that would be nice in an ideal world, but if we're somewhere in between that, you'll usually find the truth. And I think that's true of just about everything. Um, and, and what you see in the news now are, are, are natural, uh, when, when some of the news sources, they look at things like vitamins and they say, well, vitamins are useless. And, and they go back and forth on this all the time. And so now there, there's a big study that came out recently and it said vitamins are completely useless. And so I ask things like, well, what kind of vitamin did you use? Did you use Centrum? I mean, that, I mean that, that stuff is garbage. It's not going to do anything for you. Um, and, and they completely try and discredit that when I could throw 20 other studies at you that, that would say the complete opposite. So we have to really be careful of saying things like fish oil has no effect on cardiovascular health because it's pretty well established that it does. You can't just take that one study that they blow up to epic proportions and they say it has no effect. How many of you guys have heard of genetically modified foods? Is just about everybody aware? Okay. <laughs> um, I, will, I will kind of speed through these then so we have time to get, but I, I just want to, I want to highlight a couple things here. Um, genetically modified foods are the forceful insertion of genetic material into another species. And this is done for various reasons, and most of them are marketing reasons, but they say things like, We'll protect your crops from drought. We'll increase the yield of your crops. We'll, we'll feed vitamin A deficiency in this rice because we're going to stick this gene in there. And the thing is, is that it, this doesn't occur in nature, ever. And, we, and some people argue that genetic modification, we've been doing it for thousands of years. We've not been doing this for thousands of years. It's not the same thing as cross-hybridization. It, we are deliberately forcing genes into some species, and there's massive collateral damage, and we don't know the true effects of that yet. So, I don't want it to be confused with hybrid breeding. And so how are they made? This is, this is what's really crazy is you have these, they use these things called gene guns, and it's literally like a shotgun, and they take this genetic material and they shoot it forcefully into whatever they're trying to inject to. They've, they've done some really crazy stuff. I, I, I've done, I do a lot of talks on, on things that, that people don't normally like to talk about. I've talked about teenage depression. I've talked a lot about um, 
genetically modified foods too. I have this other picture of there in, in that presentation of this, this uh, pig that has this glowing nose because they took uh, glowing genes from a fish and they put it in there. Why do they do this stuff? Because they can. And, and it, we need to know how far it's going to go. So there are other methods that they use too. They use viruses, they use bacteria um, to put these genes into, and it's so, it's everywhere. You can't get away from it. And right now, the first genetically modified animal is currently being pending approval by the FDA. So on the top here, we have a genetically modified salmon at eight, 18 months, saying a regular salmon at 18 months. Some people think that, God, that GMO stands for God move over. And, and I, I can see that. I mean, especially when we get into stuff like this. You know, where do we stop this? It, uh, and, and I say this because there, there's a lot of concerns about genetically modified foods. Um, there have been no human clinical trials. There have been, there's been no post-market monitoring, so they don't look at the effects of these. It's impossible to track because it's so deep into our system now. There's no labeling, so even if you wanted to avoid GMOs, you can't entirely. It's going to be there and you're going to eat them. The effects of these things may not be known for many years. And, and then in addition, there's a lot of false claims about these marketing benefits. They say that they have higher crop yields and things. But the data doesn't support that. Their data supports that. You go on to websites like Monsanto.com and they'll tell you, yeah, we're, we're doing great things for the world. Um, but it couldn't be further from the truth. So even though there hasn't been, even though there hasn't been human clinical trials, there's been a lot of animal clinical trials, and they don't, but they won't allow U.S. researchers to do this. That has to be done internationally by third-party researchers outside the U.S. So we have um, things like this guy. They, they did a really long, um, did a long-term animal feeding trial. And what they found, what the rats were fed, they had a control group where it was fed just normal corn, and then they had another group that was fed a diet of exclusively genetically modified foods, genetically modified corn to be precise. And they found that it had damage to nearly every organ system in the body, and alarmingly fast tumor growth within a very short period of time. This isn't the only study that's shown this. There, there have been many others that have replicated this result as well, but you don't hear about these. And it, it, it causes other things like um, stunted growth on the right here. We have a much smaller rat. Our, so this would be fed genetically modified um, corn in this study, and then this would be a, a rat fed regular non-GMO corn. And so the, it raises a lot of questions. Things like you look at the fertility rate of women and how it's constantly dropping all the time. And versus before, this, this was not, not an issue at all, but now we have, we have fertility clinics on just about every street corner in California. And there's a lot, there's a lot of evidence, too, that some of these systems are, are uh, being damaged. So I, I'm concerned about our future generations. I'm, I'm concerned about will we reach a point where we cannot produce children anymore. I know it sounds wild, but... If you look at the data, it just it really supports that kind of thing. Here's our villi again. Here's these guys um, that are uh, on the right. There was a researcher, and he fed GMO potatoes are actually not on the market. Don't worry about that one. It was just done in, in labs. Um, but on the right, we have significant cell growth, and within just 10 days, um, which put these rats at at risk for colon cancer and many of them developed it. And this research was buried, and, and the companies like Monsanto and DuPont, they completely discredited this researcher, buried him, shamed him, and now you don't care about it. And we're one of the few countries that has no form of labeling whatsoever. And there are 64 other countries that have some form of mandatory labeling. There's some websites on there. Um, I, I don't think I put them on your sheet, but if you just Google like GMO labeling, You'll, you'll find these, you can look at across the world. Um, the European Union has a lot of countries within there that has some form of mandatory labeling. And some, some countries have even banned, outright banned these um, GMO importation and cultivation of these crops. I think we have a double standard. If the Food and Drug Administration is monitoring both of these, then 
if a new pharmaceutical <laughs> drug is to be released on the market, it has to undergo extensive testing um, before it's released. Why is this not the case with genetically modified foods? It's, it, it, it really should be. And so Roundup is, is everywhere. This is, this is a pesticide that's used, you use it on your weeds. I mean, it's everywhere now. It's in our, our food, it's in our food, it's in our water. And all the runoff from this, um, Roundup is, is considered to be <clears throat> extremely disruptive to the gut bacteria. Um, number one pesticide sold in the world, made by the same company, Monsanto. And what it does is it disrupts that gut bacteria. And it causes an overgrowth of, we, we've disrupted that balance that I talked about earlier. So we no longer have that balance and we allow other organisms to kind of take over. And so if we have an unhealthy digestive system, we have an unhealthy brain. If you guys have ever taken a statistic, statistics course, or even if you haven't, um, you would know that correlation doesn't necessarily prove causation. But if we look at this graph here, um, this was actually collected by governmental data. And um, this is uh, 1997 is right around where uh, genetically modified crops were introduced, and that's where Roundup became. I mean, they have to. They feed on this Roundup. They have to have this Roundup within the genetically modified crops. Um, and the red line is also showing the correlation between GMO crops, pesticides, and autism. And there's actually a 98.5 uh, Pearson correlation coefficient. So that's just a big word of saying that there's a very close relation between the two and overwhelmingly so. Some studies have said that, that Roundup could plausibly be the most important factor uh, in the observed, observed increase in a number of disease and conditions like obesity and autism over the past two decades. So are GMOs in my food? I mean, absolutely. You're, you're probably eating GMOs three meals a day, every day. And especially if you're eating fast food. I mean, it's, it's it's in all fast food, it's in greater than 80% of fast food, depending on the source. I think we'll take a quick break after this slide here. Um, the, and so what do we have now? We have the standard American diet. And this is kind of getting into the more, the more functional things that are going to apply to you individually. Um, and what is the standard American diet made of? It's made of very pro-inflammatory oils. So things like canola. Things like vegetable oil um, that we cook in on a regular basis and every restaurant that you go to is going to be using these oils because it's cost efficient. It's very cost efficient. It's also low in omega-3s and very high in omega-6s. So omega-3s, if you've heard of that buzzword, it's, they are fatty acid chains that, are, um, that help to stabilize cells and, and create fluidity in your body and prevent inflammation. Omega-6s, on the other hand, are inflammatory. And so we go back to, if in high doses, it more, it's more about the ratio. So you can have some omega-6s and be fine. But the ratio is so different now. We have so much more omega-6s. Going back to corn and soy, so everything that we eat, corn and soy, very high in omega-6s. And so we have that ratio off. So we're prone to inflammation there. We have inflammatory oils. We have inflammatory foods. We have 3,968 food additives, according to the FDA's website. Pull this information off their website. And we have genetically modified foods in every meal. And the irony behind all this is, despite the fact that Americans are eating more calories than any other country in the world, we're starving on the inside. I mean, we, we just, we're always looking for those nutrients. We want zinc. We want magnesium. We want all these things that we can't find anymore. And this system, this mechanized system, is destroying that. Absolutely destroying it. The, the GMO technology and conventional farming is completely destroying any type of uh, quality soil. And so we, we keep running down the soil. Everything starts in the soil. It starts from the ground up. If you want to have a healthy gut, we've got to have healthy soil. And, and we keep doing this, destroying the system. Um, of the fine-tuned soil and all the microbes that are in there, 
we're in for real trouble in the future. I promise that, that this isn't all bad news. <laughs> the rest of this is, is really good news. I think it's a good point to, to take a break here. Um, I'm going to have, uh, we're going to do a little like mindful eating exercise. So there are some cups of, of little nuts. Don't eat the nuts. Just grab a cup and we'll, uh, we'll come back. Let's come back in about seven minutes here. And we'll wrap up the rest of this.